ideas at the house. Today I am speaking with someone whose bio reads like a Gen X fantasy life. Ioni Sky has co-starred or collaborated with such legends as Keanu Reeves, John Cusack, River Phoenix, Madonna, Sofia Coppola, Kim Gordon, Selma Blair, Margaret Cho, Lena Dunham, the list goes on and on. Her dad is the 60s pop superstar Donovan, her mum is the model Enid Carl. Her brother is the model actor musician Donovan Leach. She used to live with Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. She was married to Adam Horowitz from the Beastie Boys and is currently based in Sydney with her singer-songwriter husband Ben Lee. But to only introduce Ioni Sky by name-checking all the geniuses in her life is to do a disservice to her own amazing creative output. As an actress, she has starred in classic movies including River's Edge, Say Anything and Gas, Food and Lodging, and more recently in television series including Arrested Development, Camping and Good Girls. She's also a writer of successful children's books, a writer and director of short films, and an accomplished painter. Ioni Skye, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to the Sydney Opera House. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How are you finding Sydney? You've been based here for the last little while and it's the classic Australian interview opening question. I love it. I love the nature. I love the harbour beaches. I love the food, um, the people. I just really have nothing bad to say about it, to be honest. You were born in London, but then spent you know, most of your early childhood in California, in Los Angeles. What sort of a family were you born into? My uh, mother is originally a New Yorker, and she's a classic kind of New Yorker with a kind of accent, grew up in Queens and the Bronx and Brooklyn. So my mother came to Los Angeles in the 60s and just never ever left basically. I mean she modeled a little in France and lived in England with my father. But by the time I was born they were on, they were on and off mm -hmm. as a couple already. I have an older brother. So we, she came back to Los Angeles. As and a single mom. As a single mom with my brother and with me. She made it work. There were a lot of women who were single moms back then who were sort of, I guess because it was her friend group, a lot of women who were had kids of musicians. Famous musicians. Exactly. Yeah. So we had like quite a few friends of mine are the children of famous musicians, right. which we don't like go around talking about it, which it would be good, it would be very therapeutic to kind of like bond <laughs> over it. But I guess we just know that we're sort of in the same boat. But luckily it wasn't, my mother was at the end of the day, kind of just loved being a mom, loved cooking. So it could have been more frantic and kind of chaotic, I suppose. But she, at the end of the day, just, we had our delicious food and we had a very open creative house in, in this old beautiful funky house. And she was kind of the, they were the house that everyone came to. So there were a lot of creative people and a lot of single moms who mm -hmm. were making it work. So, you know, was it was it a happy childhood there when you when you look back? Yes, very fun, very happy. I mean, I didn't grow up with my father, so that was this missing kind of hmm. hole in my life. And I became friends with him when I was, and we have a relationship when I was about 17, 18. And that's been very interesting because he's Celtic, poetic, completely different uh, to my mother in some ways and uh, but you really do genetically get so much it's so right. fascinating that is interesting isn't mm -hmm. it that somebody who's had no input into your upbringing can still influence you sort of genetically in yes. some way yeah and so you feel that do you you feel I that do. Kind it of... was really nice I see why people who are adopted want to know their family mm -hmm. because you do I do see similarities and also the way he deals the good and the bad with people so what what's your relationship with him now do you do you see each other much is it yeah maybe once a year which doesn't sound like a lot well, it's but it's more than a lot of, of families yeah he lives in Ireland even though he's Scottish uh, and my husband and I went to see him two summers ago and we stayed in his house in the country and it was just really fantastic 
you know, when you go somewhere and you stay with someone mm. in their house instead of just being a tourist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he has a very, you know, magical, he's still sort of stuck in the 60s and it's very magical. And my daughter said, I didn't know my grandparents were, uh, I think she said wizards when we left because <laughs> everything is very, um, you know, by the moon and the tarot and the candles right. lit and the this and the that and it's really fun and she, she thought it was she thought it was humorous even at her young age she could tell but she liked it. So when you were a kid, it must have been weird to not know the father that kind of everybody knew. Like like was was that a was that a kind of difficult negotiation for you as a child and a teenager? Yes, I think. I mean, it was interesting because my father, when I was in elementary school, kids my age didn't really know who he was. It was more my mother's right, generation, right. whereas some kids. Uh, for example, one of my friends' fathers in Fleetwood Mac, right. and so not to name drop, but that was just mm -hmm. happened to be. But at the time we were kids, they were really popular still in the '70s. I mean, in some ways, sure, he he probably will always have certain songs, if you know who he is, that are just sort of iconic in in a way that maybe I would never live up to. But I think I chose acting and I paint and I write. I didn't choose music yeah. and maybe there was a reason for that. But I do choose musicians as my partners. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know, daddy I, issues? <laughs> I know, exactly. Because you met him for the first time when you were, what, 18? Yes, about 18, 17, 18. Yeah. I mean, like, if ever there is a time that you are likely to be filled with rage against your parents or your dad for whatever reason, it's probably around that kind of age. Yes. How did you feel about meeting him? Was that something that you were felt was necessary, were excited about? Um... Well, my, my brother always wanted to know my father and I was always a bit I think I had a lot of pride I didn't I was sort of like well you didn't make the effort I'm not gonna make the effort whereas my brother he really needed to and finally he said come on you're coming with me they're in Los Angeles he and his my stepmother and we have to see him so I was kind of insecure really I wanted to impress him I felt very kind of shut down but then I I saw that he, what type of person he was, and he kind of, you sort of have to dive into his world. And I did write the one letter to him saying, I really think you should have done this differently in this way and that way. And I got kind of got it all out in that letter. Did he acknowledge that? I mean, that? he's sort of acknowledged it. It's not, it wasn't like the movies where, you know, <laughs> now it's going to be different. Like he still was the way he was, and it wasn't like he apologized, and then we had this whole different relationship without any more kind of hurt feelings like he still kind of wasn't always terrific but he's this particular artist type of person you got into movies in a kind of unexpected way it was never really a goal of yours I mean you've said that you've you know imagined yourself being a writer or a teacher or something so movie star wasn't really in your kind of list of expectations of your life was it no no Really, my brother was acting. He was very opposite <clears throat> to me. He was very outgoing and just, he got himself an agent. He got himself into commercials. My mother was baffled. She just did not, you know, she was in I did not no raise way. you for this. Yeah, uh. she just, it wasn't that she was embarrassed of it. She just couldn't, she more just couldn't believe he, she, she would never be able to put herself in front of a right. camera. She was more just couldn't believe so mystified. Mystified, mm. the, the, the courage, I suppose. But when River's Edge, the first movie I was in, was being cast, I think, and I should ask him this because it's always my assumption that he brought in this paper, this like LA Weekly magazine that he and I, my brother and I were in, but not because we were like child models. It was just my mother had a friend and she was the photographer and she used our living room and took the picture and she brought in all these kids. So I think he brought it in to show the casting person like, hey, I'm in this, like he was a real hustler and put, you know, just like making it happen. And I was in the picture and she said, well, who's that? She looks, you know, good for one of the roles. And so he kind of got me in and convinced me and I did not want to do it. I was really scared to audition. And I remember being on a walk with my mother's best friend and she said, well, if you just, you could try it. And what's, if you don't get it, you're still at school and you know, and if you do, it'll be an adventure. And so I think I really wanted it more than I realized. Yeah. Well, it was an escape as well, wasn't it? 
Yeah, mm. for sure. So that movie was River's Edge and you were cast across from Keanu Reeves along with Crispin Glover and, and Dennis Hopper and all of these people. And it was a huge success at the time. You've also said that it's the only movie that you can watch objectively and still really enjoy. Was that because you think you did a really good job or is that because it was so long ago? Like, like what was it about that movie that you can feel so proud of now? Yeah, I think I'm proud of a lot of the movies, but it's true that I don't know if I was so young that I have enough years away from that age where um, I can look at it and think, oh, that's sweet. And maybe it's like when you watch old films of yourself when you're a kid, if you go back far enough, you think, oh, that's so cute. And then there's certain ages that you, oh my God, I can't, you know. And a lot of my movies, I was like in my teens and 20s and it's a bit of a cringy time, sadly, just for yourself. It doesn't need to be, but often we're hard on ourselves. So the next job was Say Anything, which has become a complete and total cult classic, I guess. How were you cast was that? Was that because the director Cameron Crowe saw you in River's Edge and liked your work there, or was Actually, it? Actually, I have to thank for Say Anything, I have to thank Moon Zappa, Frank Zappa's kid. This sounds very name droppy, but they lived in Laurel Canyon and this cool house that just was like the, the house to go to. It was super creative and fun. And I became friendly with Moon Zappa, and she, they knew their house was just, any, everyone wanted to hang out there. It was a really fun house. And she, she told me one day, Cameron Crowe, he wrote Fast Times at Richmond High, and he's, there's a movie he's casting, and I think you should, and he's, Cameron Crowe's a complete music, well, he worked mm -hmm. at Rolling Stones, he's a complete music fanatic. So she, entered, she got us to sort of meet at her place, and, I think he knew who my dad was and he knew I was working and but I really had to work hard to get that role because oh, yeah? yeah I think I just a lot of people I, I don't know I think I put, don't put forward a very I used to not put forward a very confident persona of I'm an actor. I was very kind of push pull. Well, you were 17 and you'd done like one film, so go yes, easy on yourself. Yes. That's true. That's true. So I think I really, I just basically had to kind of do a lot of auditions for that. Right. Whereas John Cusack was established and he, we were, we were like begging him to do the role mm -hmm. because he was, he didn't want to do any more teen romance movies. Right. He and was getting typecast by that point. He was point, very probably. typecast. Yeah. And lo thankfully he did it because it turned out to be a little, maybe deeper than some of the movies mm. he had done. Did you feel like um, after that you got a bit typecast as well? Because there, there was, you know, the Rachel Papers as well, you know, you play a kind of slightly out of reach, kind of, you know, object of like remote desire for the, for the male protagonist. Yeah, I mean, as far as being typecast, I, I don't, my career, I don't feel ever blew up enough to get sick of any kind of typecasting. Mm. And it is really true too that Hollywood still writes in archetypes for female characters and so getting a female, I mean that was one of the beauties of Gas Food Lodging was that these were female characters that actually had some, you know, some depth and nuance that you could really... Yes, a hundred percent, yeah. And mm. it's so interesting what makes it, what you know, what I wonder what makes some of those roles feel more real and layered and mm. complex and what makes some of them just feel like they're just sort of serving this purpose of, I don't know. What do you think that is? What? I, maybe it's the writer, I, I, I think, if, yeah, all the details and the nuances and just the vibe and the right, the, I guess it's who is writing it. Um, I mean, Gas Food and Lodging was written by Alison Andrews, and she's a very complex, deep, unique person. I don't know, maybe it's that, mm -hmm. who, the, who the writer is, yeah. So at this time, you know, the movies that you were in were getting, you know, huge amounts of critical acclaim, huge amounts of commercial acclaim, cues around the block for Say Anything. And around this time, you met Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who became your first boyfriend. Mm. How did you meet him? I did a movie with Flea, and I didn't know who the Red Hot Chili Peppers were. They were not a big band at all, but he, I actually had a crush on Flea. He's just super dynamic and amazing. And he was spoken for, and he, but he said, I have this friend, but he's like in rehab, and I just thought, ooh. But also, I must have been intrigued. I didn't mm. know enough to, think run, run away. But I just thought, oh, that sounds fun. And so let's just say it was not a fun few years 
for I mean, a young person yeah. at all. And thankfully, it was such a big lesson. I, I really, I was sort of emotionally intelligent for some reason. I've always been very analytical and I just thought, this is a, this is a big warning sign. Why are you, never do this again. And I honestly, never did that again. I never went with someone who's that wild. So, I mean, you've, you've described it as a dark time in your life, and I, but if you had to sort of characterise some of the things about being in love with an addict or dating an addict or living with an addict, those sorts of things, like why do you think it is that you get so caught up in that? It's just so strange. It really does something, you just, you really do get caught up in their well-being and for some reason it's hard to get out of that and just think they're gonna be okay and I guess it's just it's its own like addiction to feel mm. like if they're okay you're okay and I mean I notice it now with my kids and I think every parent does this you're happy when your kids are happy and when right. they're not happy you're not happy and so I don't know it could be the same type of thing but I really had that moment of clarity where just one evening I just it hit me you this is not your job you're not you're not a nurse you're not his mother you're not a professional person taking you know this is not your job and I it was this great when you hear those great voices you know whatever was to me it wasn't like an outside voice it was just like this isn't your job and it and then I like called him and was like we are breaking up and then so it's something up. precipitated that had like let you know or had he just sort of gone AWOL again and you were like it wasn't even mm. it's one of those weird things I think it's just that you you know I was reading about it I mm. was reading books and talking to people and I wasn't I was isolating in a sense but also not isolating which is good and I think it's just the dots finally you know, people say, like my friend said, you walk behind him when he walks down the street, like just, you, you're losing your luster, you're, you know, you're not, and that didn't, it wasn't that day, you know, but mm. that was in there, and then it's this thing that you read, and then, and I think it all, just there's sometimes a and moment where finally you, like, you yeah. can do that and sort of break free. But I really, he apologized, a little bit later in a very nice way and we're not we don't see each other all the time but I honestly have no I don't know I have no hard feelings so once you broke up with him it actually wasn't that long after that you met Adam Horowitz who became mm -hmm. your husband yes how did you meet him my brother was doing a movie with Adam Horowitz's sister Rachel Horowitz right. who's a producer now and she was a doing publicity and my brother and Rachel got along you know really well as, as friends and then he found out who her brother was and they, the Beastie Boys were at the height of just everyone was playing them mm -hmm. at all times and my brother we were all this so is like the young, late 80s right late 80s yeah. and my brother's like brought bringing Rachel Adam Horvitz's sister over and we all they're New Yorkers and maybe because my mom's a New Yorker we just all felt very comfortable together and so um, I was still with Anthony when I met Adam right. and we actually were starting to kind of fall in love but we you know waited and then when I broke up with Anthony he said okay you know now let's do this and I said I think I need a second he was like no I waited for you and it was so romantic and I thought okay let's do this and we moved in together right away and you know I was I got married at 21 I mean it was really fun and we were married about four years and it was it's still heartbreaking to me because I almost feel like I really lost a brother or we were so I mean we were very romantic and we had a great marriage but I still find it painful you were the cheese he was the macaroni exactly I mean, I have such a good marriage beyond, like, the best. So i really lucky in love. I mean, I'm so lucky in love. But, yeah, I still feel sad. Because it is hard when you divorce and you don't, you know, you do lose, like, a best friend. For sure. If you don't stay friends. And can you tell me a little bit about that time? You know, that kind of late 80s, early 90s when, you know, the Beastie Boys were one of the most popular and sort of coolest bands in the world and everybody around you. I mean, being at the absolute epicenter of that, what sort of a time was it for you and sort of broader culturally? I mean, I think kind of I ideal because we got to still be in every city we were in. 
like I got to get to know the West Village in New York in this really inside way that was very real and it wasn't being in limousines and paparazzi and you know this sort of weird life it was truly just we were incognito like rarely stopped on the street and it was sort of the best in a way because because we were it was a very creative group so it was really really just truly fun i mean you know it's life so you have your things sure. that are going on but yeah, I think it was ideal because it was exciting and with people we admired, but it wasn't, I don't know, I don't feel like people, we were super self-conscious about, you know, who we were with and what we were doing. Mm. and um, You were just doing it. We were just doing it. Mm. After this whole period, you know, you started making movies again. And as a sort of young woman coming through that sort of thing, like how was that? And the reason I'm asking this question is that when I was preparing for this interview, I watched an interview from 1999 that you did with Howard Stern. Oh, man. I, like, couldn't believe how gross he was. Like, he talked oh, yeah. the whole time about all he could talk about in the movies was the fact that you'd done a nude scene. Oh, right. Um, he was obsessed with the fact that you'd been dating women after the end of your marriage. He was, like, so... And, you know, that isn't that long ago. Like, it's, what, 20 years ago? Well, maybe yeah. it is long ago. But I wonder whether that kind, those sorts of incredibly skeezy, sexist, right. objectifying attitudes was something that you encountered a lot as a kind of, you know, actor in, actress I mean, in your 20s? or Do you well, remember that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, Howard Stern, at the time, everyone knew what he was like. And when I got the offer to do that interview, my I remember my mother and my brother and I don't know who else, someone else said, don't do it, He's you know what he's like. And I knew what he was like. And I became more of a fan. I became a fan of his after that. I knew who he was, but I wanted to do it because I wanted to stand in the, you know, face of that and diffuse it. Kind of like almost when you get pulled over by a cop and if you have a certain energy about you, it like diffuses it. And it didn't diffuse it, but it was, it wasn't like I was doing like a magic spell, but I didn't want to say, how dare you and be ruffled because I knew what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to sort of normalize that stuff and be a kind of represent that you could be an intelligent, young, pretty woman and have someone try to sexualize you and it not work. Around this time too, you met your elder daughter's father and had your elder daughter. Was that a shift in your life? I mean, it, it often is. How did her arrival in your world shift things? Yeah, I mean, I, I at the time I wanted I, I really went from 29 to 30 and was just like, I want a kid, I want a kid. And I got, it was the first time I was sort of put together by somebody. And it was- Like a setup. Like a setup. Mm -hmm. And it was through a very good friend of mine, but it was almost two friends having a kid to have a kid, right. almost. We, we pretended we were gonna try for it, but, and we were, but we were really mismatched is maybe the wrong word, but it just, I think when you first have a kid, it's very confrontational. I notice a lot of women fear they're gonna be like losers and lose their life, and I'm sure men do as well, but. Probably less so. Maybe less so. So yeah, that was interesting. All the things that come up, the feeling like, what's my life gonna be, your identity. You managed to kind of co-parent really successfully with him, even though the relationship didn't last. Did that change your relationship with your own mother? I mean, recently I said to my mother, thank you, I'm so grateful you like me because I have a teenager now who I do like, but I see that not everybody likes the personality of their children. And I just thought that was a given. Mm. And so, so many God, it'd be things. brutal if your own parents didn't like you, wouldn't it? I know, but they could happen where they just, you just don't have your, as you both become adults, mm. your personalities, who knows? I don't know. I guess I just see that, it, that there are some choices that are very caring for parents, where, whereas I thought before I was a parent that it was just a given that you just did all these wonderful things for your kid. And now that I'm a parent, I realize it's like, 
work. S work. Mm -hmm. Um, you've spoken a lot about your husband, Ben Lee. How did you guys meet? He was on the Beastie Boys label, wasn't he? Yes. But that can't have been when you like got together. No, we. He was. He's eight years younger. So I. He was. Yeah, this kid wonder in the states, and I know over here. Yeah, he, we know. Yeah, and especially because he was on my ex-husband's label, we really knew about him, and everyone thought he was fantastic. And then when he was eighteen, he was in town, and. I had never met him, I knew of him, but uh, my best friend was dating one of his best friends. I was newly separated from Adam, and I was having a Christmas Eve kind of casual get together with my family kind of thing. Ben came over, he ended up spending the night, but not romantically, because he was at the time just sort of on tour, and, mm -hmm. and but he came over, he met the same night I met him, he met my brother, my mother, my stepfather, my little brother. And we because we knew so many of the same friends, it felt and it was kind of a fun was there a wild spark time. At the... No, I thought of he you know, I was twenty five or something. And you were and a divorcee. I was a divorcee. So he, <laughs> I was this Mrs. Robinson character and he was like you know, 18. Yeah, right. And of um, this skinny little eighteen year old. So I thought, but he's so intelligent and he's been he's like a sort of old man, he's always been waiting to be the age he is now, he's not old, but <laughs> he's so well-spoken and fun. So I, we, we were on the same level is what I'm saying, but not romantically. So when did that switch? Like, was there a point where you were like, ah, oh, Ben Lee? Yes, so I, my daughter was about four or five and I was, you know, a single, sort of a single mother with a kid. You're not thinking of dating right away because I've, you know, most, you're very protective of your little kid and I didn't want to expose her to my, a dating life. I mean, I dated a little bit, but I was very protective of her and, you know, wanting her to have her father relationship and that was all going well and everything. So I, I was at the Chateau Marmont, this, you know, kind mm -hmm. of cool hotel in LA. I don't know, Ben called for some reason because they, you know, we were friends, not very good friends. And oh, I, I was sort of chasing a friend of Ben's who wasn't that interested in me. And I think what happened was I went to the opening of this movie where Ben's friend was in the movie and he was with other people. And and the next day, a friend of mine who was with us said, what about Ben? You know, that he was so fab fabulous, whatever. So then, yeah, we went to out on a date. So that was ten. And that years, was it. Ten years after we first met, I'm more aggressive. So I was, and I also thought I had it in the bag for some reason because <laughs> he Ben comes across as just like the nicest person, and I just thought, oh, I was a bit like full of myself, and I called him too many times, which was funny, and he was sort of pushing me off. And then I, I just thought, ooh, I guess I have to play a bit of a game. So then I didn't call him for two weeks, which I don't usually do games, but I just thought, ooh, I guess I came on too strong. And like, that's not good. And so, then you and then pulled he, off and he warmed up. Like two weeks later, he's like, uh, where, where did you go? So that, you know, and then he kind of came, we were on the same page. So you, you got married in India and, and, you know, there is a sort of, you know, he has spoken a lot about being kind of interested in spiritual pursuits and you know that is presumably something you've pursued as a couple like do you guys have a sort of shared spiritual practice or or what like like what's your sort of idea about that now we have now it's none because it was just too much too <laughs> it, wasn't, it did seem pretty often. intense there yeah, for a while i mean obviously i if i was with someone like, not obviously, but looking back, because his was so intense, I just thought, oh, I am I am not like that at all. But when I look back, I think, well, that's actually not true. Like I did a lot of Kundalini yoga there and was mm. I went to India like before I met him. So although I feel like I was always skeptical, I definitely was interested here and there, but not to the extent that Ben would go into things, which was really difficult at times I have to say and he'll mm -hmm. he'll say too you know better than being with a drug addict but still sometimes a bit intense when someone's like that you've got a daughter together and so there's like four of you in the family now when you look at your daughters who are what now 19 11, and 11 right how do you compare where they are themselves as teenagers young women to how you were at the same age I mean you know, do you think there's a difference between Gen X and Gen Z or whatever they are in now? And if so, what do you think those differences might be? 
Yeah, I think their awareness about their anxieties and moods is for better or worse, like they're very aware of where they are emotionally. And for me, I think in my 20s is when I started really being aware of certain things I was feeling and doing and trying to kind of, you know, deal with things that were coming up, depression, anxiety, whatever happens in your life. They're, it seems, doing it younger, like a whole decade younger than when I feel like, I, I think in my teens, I mean, yeah, they're hard. Everyone will say teenage years are hard, but I would think I was a little more unaware of. Mm. Didn't have know, the language for it, maybe? I didn't have the language mm. for it. So I'm hoping having the language for it earlier is better and bodes well. What's a good life for you? I mean, I think, yeah, like feeling, you know, healthy and grateful and if, you know, having, you know, the people around you be uh, also like happy enough, you know, I mean, that's nice. And, and, you know, like anyone, I kind of want the world to be like more peaceful and move in a direction of, you know, the environment going better and all of those things. And for me personally, yeah, when my marriage is in, in, in good shape and I mean, it sounds so dumb, but just the people close to me are in good shape. Uh, you know, I mean, we all have to go through things, but and we're, when we're all sort of connecting, that seems to help a lot. Like sometimes I'll feel like a bit weird and kind of sad and strange. And I think, oh, actually, I haven't just, like sat next to my 11 year old for a while. Mm -hmm. and connected with her and then I'll just do something like that and I feel like way better and it brings it back to kind of like smaller things but I definitely you know I love working I could forget that I like working because I actually kind of like sort of floating around I'm very like spacey so I'll do that and then I think oh wait 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 I've got to like get centered and so then I talk to Ben and I'm like wait what what do, I, what do I like to, you know, and he's Remind like, you me. like, you like to try to develop films. Yes, yes, and TV shows. And yeah, yeah, because I can get a little bit sort of floaty. But, um, you know, the old balance thing that everyone talks about. At the end of the day, it's just the basic things as well, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, Ione Sky, it has been such a pleasure talking oh, to you nice today. To Thank to you so much for coming to the Sydney Opera House uh, and yes. spending some time. Thank you for mm -hmm. having me.